I'm going to talk about uh, statistics on evolving random networks. Louder, okay. Uh, but before coming to statistics, we are going to uh, walk m many many blocks. So the, the plan of the of the talk is first I'm going to give uh, an in introduction of networks. What is the, the type of things that elves like, uh, what is uh, brain functional networks, and then I, I'm going to talk about how to make statistics of networks when you have an ensemble of networks, how you can compute or calculate summary measures like what is a, the, the average network, what is the variance of a sample of networks, uh, how, how to do uh, cluster analysis, for example, when you have many networks. And I if I have time, I will say something about principal components uh, for networks. Okay? So, uh, the, the, uh, the first thing is that th there is a, a huge... Uh, basically, networks mo models are characterized by two different things, if they are dynamical or if they are static random networks. In dynamical random networks, there are some uh, approaches or models that try to understand what happens to a network model when the number of nodes grows. So The, the question has to be, well, what happens when the number goes go to infinity? What, what is the structure of that network? There are, there are another type of networks that, that have a fixed number of nodes. And when you have fixed number of nodes, like brain networks, the typical questions, at least the first typical question, were like how uh, epidemic is spread in that network and how sensitive to the topology they are. When you have static random networks, there are two types of problems. One is Okay, here's the network, characterize it. And there are many things to do. For example, I want to describe that the network can be separated in models. How, how can I do that? What is a, a nice algorithm to do that? Because working with networks is, is difficult. Uh, or, for example, uh, what about motif? Some part of these networks and and how they repeat in, in, in the big structure. And the, the other type of uh, characterization of static random networks has to be with uh, networks that you want to study how they behave in the thermodynamic limit. When n go, n go to infinity, what happened to that network? But th there is no time. Just you think that network is bigger. But, okay. And typ the typical questions has to be which is there any, th for example, in a threshold such that you, you have uh, a, a huge component. So uh, I will describe this. This is incorrect. It's 960, the first paper about Erdos Rangi. I'm going to talk about these three models very quickly. What, what is the Erdos Rangi model? What is the Watts Trogats and Barabasi model? Uh, let's start with Erdos Rangi model. Okay. In the Erdos Rangi model, we have this is notation, a graph which has n nodes and the probability of a link is p. Okay, so the, the way to construct the model is extremely simple. A graph is constructed by connecting the n nodes uh, randomly, and each of the total number of edge can be included or not with probability p. Okay, 
So we have, like, let's say, three nodes. I, I think I have a figure here. Hmm? So this is the n nodes. Probability is zero. So there is no, no link. Small probability. There, there are some links. And for example, p equals 0 0.2, and there are more links. So this is extremely simple. Wh what are the questions? At least Erdos and Renzi did. It's not, not important. OK. The first very simple thing. What is the degree distribution? What is degree? Degree is the number of links that have a node Okay, in this situation. In this situation, <laughs> we can calculate very easy that. Uh, for example, if, you, if, if we have, let's say, one, two, three, up till n nodes. Hmm? Now, choose at random a, a node, let's say this one, and how many links it has? It can have one, or one with this one, or these two, or it can have n minus one links. Okay. So if if you compute the probability of degree equal degree equal k. It's the same of throwing n minus 1 times a coin that has a probability p of, of having head, and just counting how many heads you have. Okay? And this is a very well-known distribution that is a binomial distribution that is the, the probability of having a link is k, so you will have a, it's p, p, so you will have k links. You will have 1 minus p links that does not exist. And when you say, for example, you have three links, which pair of three links? So from the total that are n minus one node, you have to choose k. OK? So you have a binomial distribution for the, the degree. That uh, perhaps uh, your, this strange, uh, seems strange, because you always uh, heard about Poisson distribution. But you know that a binomial distribution, if the n is large and np is constant, Becomes a Poisson distribution. Okay. Remember that uh, typically, for p not being very small or not being one, the the binomial distribution is like a like a normal distribution. But this is a, a very simple question. The the question that they were interested in was what happened in the thermodynamic limit in the Erdos Renzi model. For example, that there is six, a, a giant component. If you rearrange this, you, you can obtain a figure like this one. Okay? There are nodes that has no link, some nodes that are linked, structure of two links, structure of three links, and this big structure. Okay? This is what is called a giant component. And the question is, this giant component exist for every, uh, for e every P? Okay. <laughs> I, and they, they were very precise with, with this characterization. They show that, for example, uh, if N tam times P is equal to 1, then the graph will have uh, almost surely have a larger component whose size is n to 2 thirds. And that uh, if n times p 
is greater than one, uh, there, there exists a giant component, and the other structure are very small, are log n. Okay, w what this means uh, in an easy way. First thing, w as we know, uh, the, the degree distribution is binomial. So we, we can know what is the average degree for a node. If the problem is a problem of coins, if you throw 1,000 coins and p is the probability of, of having tail, you will have n times p in average number of, of uh, uh, exits. Okay? So here's the same. n times p will be the average degree when n is very large. Hmm? That's why. The, the, the threshold is related with n times p. In average, how many links you have? And this can be summarized in this way. Okay? Here it says, if, if you have a, a p such that the mean degree is lower than 1, the size of the Xi'an component is 0. That means there does not exist any Xi'an component. But if the mean degree is greater than 1 or equal 1, there will exist. This is very similar to what um, uh, Mauro told about branching process. In the bran branching process, when you have this is the father and can have childs and this can have childs, the, the, the parameter that describes this type of behavior is what is the expected, or the average, number of uh, sons? And, and, and he explained that it, if it's one, you are in the critical case. If it's greater than one, you are in the supercritical. If it's slow, the, this branching dies. OK, this eventually dies. And this is the same type of behavior, but for networks. OK, what about the, this is 998, nine OK, many years later. So this paper in Nature about Watson and Strogatz proposed a model, OK, that is start with a, with a ring uh, with n vertices, and, n, and you can, and each vertice is connected with its neighbor, first neighbor, and also second neighbor, and then just go and say, with probability p, this will disappear. I, I will rewire it to any place, to any node. OK? So when you do that, you observe this type of structure. But w what is the result? You see, that's now pay attention. And she look, and she see. Okay, the, this is the average path length. The average path length decrease with p, and the clustering. The average path length is how, how near are two two nodes, and the clustering coefficient is how how your neighbors are connected. But she's not excited. She excites when she sees, oh, this is in logarithmic scale. What does it mean that? That a very small change in p makes the, the average path length completely change. Okay? And in this play about hobbits and elves, this is a hobbit observing the same paper. He observed the model, he observed the results, he observed the log scale, and so what? <laughs> and I think <laughs> we have hobbits must inhibit 
our decided response to this because perhaps it's not so important as we believe and try to show that there's something interesting there. Okay? The, the third paper about networks, these are not brain networks, it's a, it's a science paper about everybody know, Barabasi and Albert. And th this is the, the abstract. It says, systems as diverse as genetic networks or the World Wide Web are best described as networks with complex topology. A common property of many large networks is that the vertex or the degree connectivity follows as a scale-free power law. Okay, that's the first time power law appears in networks. This feature was, this feature was found to be a consequence of two generic mechanisms. So they, they, they show a model that say the model is like this, network is spanned continually by adding a new vertices. And new vertices attach preferentially, that's the important point of the paper, to sites that are already well connected. And they, they show stationary probabilities. In the limit of n going to infinity, what is the degree distribution? Okay. So they show that, for example, that this empirical data, actor collaboration graphs has this power law distribution. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the world wide web the same and power grid data. The same, okay? So let's try to understand a little bit the model. So we have that at every time step, we add a new vertex. You have a network, okay? And now you add a, a new net node, okay? But it's a network, so it's connected. the same way, and this one will connect preferentially to nodes that, ha that have a large degree, okay? Um, okay. They show that with this very simple model, the, the stationary solution for the model is uh, proportional to k to minus 3, okay? So the model gives power law distributions. Wow. So n now I'm going to show you w what for me is like the, the network's more uh, clean for models. What, what do I mean? What do I mean with clean? Uh, always we want to uh, model some natural process, you have to make some hypothesis. And many times that hypothesis are what you can, okay? But there are some few problems where you say, okay, that, that's, the, the problem is so simple that it's okay. And what is the problem that is so simple in, in terms of growing networks? A real problem is the scientific publish publication networks. Why? Think that each paper has some reference. These references are links to old papers. It, they can't link papers that will come to us <laughs> later. Okay? <laughs> At least in this world. But the Hobbit's world, I don't know. And, and this is a directed network where the rules are clear the, the links cannot disappear when you, the paper is there, it has this reference, and it's not like World Wide Web that where some, the, the web page uh, change. So before you have some link and now you don't have, and so you don't know how to model that. So in this case, the, the, it's like the perfect model, the perfect situation for model something. Right? New publications con continually appear, really, it's a growing network, and do not disappear, important. The structure is rigid, that means published papers cannot change their reference, 
Only new papers can change the number of citations of already published works. Uh, only new papers can change. Okay, yeah. Uh, the publication that is forthcoming has no predictable number of reference. So this is an important thing. In the Barassi, in the Barassi model, they, they say the new link, the new node will have like M nodes. M, whatever you want, three, four, five. But if you see a paper, perhaps it has uh, 20 reference, other have uh, 15, other 80. So the number of references is a, is a random variable. Hmm? And uh, even knowing the number of reference, uh, the cited papers by the forthcoming publication are not uh, unpredictable. Okay. It's if if I say here's another a new paper, it has 20. 20 reference. I don't have idea to which paper will will cite. Okay. So, in in this work, what what is the impact of this distribution over uh, the in the in distribution? The in distribution is the number of sites that has each paper. Okay. And we can characterize the tail of that distribution. Okay, but the important thing here is I, I want to show that this is real data. Yeah, okay, this uh, from from Easy. There are, I don't remember how many papers, but there are a lot of papers. Uh, and we show that with proposing that the uh, out degree distribution, the number of uh, reference you put, has this structure that this structure has only one parameter, okay, we can have a very good estimate of the data. If we put another parameter, that is only for count equal, equal zero, we change. Basically, we have two parameters, if we want. You obtain this perfect uh, adjust. So uh, that is to show that when when the model when when the <laughs> the, the type of phenomena you, you are studying it has known rules. Uh, this uh, it's not difficult to to describe very well the data. Okay. So n now I'm going to talk about. Um, Brain function, uh, brain networks, not network in general. I, I only remarked these three important papers in the literature. The papers that have more than twenty thousand citations. Uh, the the, f the first thing is in brain network we have anatomical networks and functional networks. In the anam in anatomical network, there is a set of physical connections that link unitary uh, neural units. Okay, and in functional networks, we are measuring activity, and uh, we refer to functional connectivity to a pattern of temporal dependence that exists between the the neural units. Okay. It Take this sentence because I like that it says in that paper, brain function is the result of changing the covariance among neural en elements. I think it's, it's, uh, it's not so controversial, perhaps, this. this uh, so it's only to think about. Um, okay, now I'm going to. Uh, describe two very influential papers. Uh, in reality, I'm going to describe one influential paper and another paper that's not influential, but it is important to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so it, is there any author of that paper here? <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, uh, let's think we, we are, it doesn't matter what is the technology you use, we are observing like rest in state networks, okay? In, in the fMRI you say, and, and don't do anything, put your mind in white, whatever that means. You have 30,000 time series in EC, the same with better resolution, better resolution and in eco uh, is the same. So the th I want to think about what kind of things can be done when you have n time series. Okay. So, let's think we have n time series, okay? And there is no clock that synchronizes that, uh, for example, between patients. It's not like an EEC that you are studying an event related. There is no clock that say, okay, this is time zero, and it's very important time zero. You don't have time zero. So, when, when you have data like this, wh what type of things, easy things, can be done? So, the, the first very easy thing is, okay, why not, if this data comes from the brain, why not taking, let's say, the average value, okay? And put colors here. This is more red, this is more uh, yellow, blue, and that means the average activity is greater than here. When, when, when you do that in fMRI, you will observe, okay, you are able to recognize gray matter from white matter. Why? Because if fMRI is useful, it's because you can recognize metabolic activity, and in the white matter, must be different from gray matter. So with the average activity, you, you will not observe much than that. Second order, why not the variance? For each time series, you can have like more variance or less variance. And paint the same. When you do that, there's a paper from McIntosh. You observe basically the same. Uh, the, if, if the, the regions that have a, a high average activity have a high variance activity. So th this is not so useful. In EEG, everybody knows that the activity is, is around zero, so taking the, the average activity that has no sense. So now in, in complexity, the only thing easy to do is to study interaction between time series. Okay? To study, for example, the covariant matrix, so how correlated are two relations. It's the most easy you can do. Okay? You can do. <laughs> so, for example, this is fMRI. Just see these points. These are real FM, fMRI data. This is blue because it's below, it's, a standard, it's a standardized time series. They are between, let's say, minus three and three. Blue is below zero, red and yellow is above. And you see here, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red, okay? So they are interacting. And, and you same, the same you, you can do blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue. And, and between hemispheres, the same, the same color, same color, same color. And here you have what is called a functional network. Okay? In this very nice paper, well, Guillermo Thetch is one of the authors. This is a paper in 2005. 
they show that if you do this with fMRI data, of, for example, from resting state, and, and you study how is connected this brain functional network, just put in, computing the correlation matrix, putting a threshold, and observing w w how is the structure of, of that network, they observe this power law that Mauro was uh, te telling about us at uh, the morning. Okay? If you put, for example, a threshold of 0 0.5, you will have more links, so this is the degree distribution that have this tail, power law tail, with this other threshold, you have the same. And, and this, is, uh, this has been done for different activities, not only resting state, but in audit queue or screen queue, okay? So th that, is, uh, uh, do, 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 do. that is one of the papers that I was interested in telling about. And there is, uh, and this is the other paper, okay? This is, it's, there are many reasons I am going to tell us why, why I put this paper here. The first thing is it's 2012. The second is the Journal of Neuroscience. The third is they use the word emergence. It has an, a, a nice title to sell, you see? Emergence of stable functional network in long-term human EG. So, I want to show the data because it's important. And I meet people here that are working with functional network in EEC uh, to, to understand that there is much, much variability. So, what, what they do in this work is Let's suppose, let's simplify, okay? I have only one time series that is doing this, okay? If I look in this scale, I see much variability. If, if I see in a big scale, there is an important theorem that is the law of large number that say, the average will converge. So th 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 that's one of the important points of the paper, to show that it is stabilized after some time. The other important point for here is look, subject one, two, three, four, five. Five subjects they have. And they show that, look like what they call the core network, are all very different. So th th this is a, a big problem uh, if, if we are going to like testing groups with networks and easy. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that they, if I, um, I think they put like a th I think, I'm, I'm not sure. That the, the core is something that is in wake, in, in sleep N1, sleep N2, N3, and REM in some, with some weight. Okay? So this is also important. They, they have missions for, for five such, but in, in wake and in sleep. Okay? Um, Okay, now th th there is a, a very important question to be addressed, and many, pe many people are working, that is anatomical networks and functional networks must be related, but how? Um, we, uh, we, we show that the type of functional network observed in the brain can be generated by models on lattice, uh, but 
when the dynamic regime is near criticality. Okay? We're not saying nothing very concrete about the relationship. We only say that if you want to generate networks as similar as to brain functional networks, it is enough to have a very poor structure as a lattice and to put the system in criticality. Okay? So I, I want to show some quickly some result about that. So this model John has introduced. Uh, we have a lattice spins up or down. There is a competition between thermal effects and spin interactions. Okay, so now each spin that we are we associate with a voxel of the brain can be up or down, and we uh, study this in time, and we can uh, compute correlations between these time series, exactly equal to um, the brain functional networks. Okay, when when we do that, we observe that the temper for low temperature in the subcritical case, we have uh, distributions like um, Poisson, and in the critical case, power law appears. That was the type of networks that uh, ALUS observed. This is a much clear com comparison. This is, uh, we fix the number, the, the degree of the networks in the easy model, and now we take data, data from the functional uh, fMRI, and we compare with network with the same degree. Okay? When we do that, we obtain this type of structure. As you see, it's very similar. But one can say that, okay, the degree is similar, but the whole structure is different. So w when, when you study different things, for example, when you study the, the clustering coefficient as, the fun as a function of the degree, or when you study the, the the average degree of the neighbors of a uh, node of degree k, you see that there is really a much similarity between both uh, models. Um, for example, if, if we study spatial correlations, we can see that, for example, in, in the brain, typically in functional connectivity, you put a seed and you study what are the ra rations in the brain that are connected with that? Okay? Like the Draulio told us, told us about DMN, default mode network. And, and here we can do the same in this model. We put a seed and see how is the, the type of interaction. And we observe similar type of interaction. For example, if we study the correlation as a function of, of the distance, and, and we compare, for example, for one seed that, I, I don't know the name, MPFC, you observe that this, this uh, big correlations also appear. Okay? So w w the, the message is, it's a good model for, for obtaining... You see, in all these papers, we are working with networks, we are working with nodes, links, but the nodes are irrelevant. I never say this is some particular node that is important for brain function, or this is a very important famous paper that you have to look in detail. It's not as, as, as another paper. So we are treating all nodes as equally. But th this is something very common for ELFs, okay? We like homogeneous models because we, we can do generalities. If you say, no, in this, if you want to model this, you have to take in account this cascade of events and, and, that, and that this node is very different than this and how I put that on in a, in a model. So we have a, a bias to put 
everything homogeneous. Uh, I think um, COVID must push to, to change a little about that. So the theory of random gas is dominated by models where the label of each node is not relevant for the type of properties studied. No, are this single, but I'm, I'm not studying anything that has to be with the level of the node. Uh, nevertheless, in the majority of the real networks, such as those modeling brain connections, financial market, the internet, protein interaction, the label of each node appear naturally and it's relevant. Okay. That's why we consider important to develop some statistical methods in this space where we have nodes that we can identify, we have the same type of uh, the, the same nodes and we have for example a, a network, a brain network that evolves in time. The node is every, uh, always the same. Okay. In this direction there are some papers. For example, when when you are in in, in when surgery you, you in epilepsy you need to know where I have to put the, the knife. I don't know. <laughs> you are interested in detect perfectly well the node, so the node is very relevant. Uh, this is related with uh, what Draulio told us yesterday. Let, let's see the title, Alteration and Reorganization of Functional Network and New Perspective in Brain Injury Study. Okay? It's clear that in brain uh, injury study, it's important to specify the node and not say everything is homogeneous. Okay? With Claudia, Gislan, uh, Eduardo Martins, we, we also do uh, something in that direction. For example, when you put a very simple a stimulus such as uh, a movie of point lines play walking with a biological content or a scramble motion and we study EEG, we are interested in identifying the difference in each electrode okay which is the electrode that sends bi biological, mo uh, bi biological motion, okay? It go, go, goes in, in the same direction, okay? That nodes, uh, the, the, um, the label of each node is important. Here we show that, for example, the electrode F7 changed the degree and between us, and P3, uh, Pz, and U2, the clustering coefficient, okay? Wh when you study these two situations. But if you study, for example, this, the cross fixation before th that it was randomly chosen, uh, you don't observe any difference. That is like a, a control, okay? So, now we, we I want to talk about how to analyze a sample of networks. This was only introduction. And today at the morning I see that I have a big phase transition between this hour and next hour. So I, I, I'm going to keep it simple and, and use the blackboard. Okay, so it's only I am going to try to, to see when it's important. <laughs> Um, so, we want to first define central and variability measures. So, uh, I turn on the lights.
So be before starting with statistics of networks, let's make some comments about statistics with random variables that are much easier. Okay? So let's say we have x that is the, the result of a dice. That they throw it very high. So we know that x can take the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, uh, 5, and 6. And we know that the probability of x equal e is 1, six, one over 6. Okay, because the dice is, is a fair dice. The first thing we need to know if we want to know something about a central value is what is the expected value. And you know the expected value is simply each of the values times the probability. Hmm? Let's say this is this is one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the values of x. This is all have probability one. Okay. And we know that the expected value is one times the probability plus one times the probability plus five uh, six times this and this is 3.5 it's very easy to see that must be 3.5 because of a symmetry argument and it's the central of this and if you have to put what is the the um, the center of mass here must be here, okay? Uh, okay, what else? Something also very important is how is the variability. It's not the same to have this type of a structure or a structure like this, like this. And how, how you compute the, the variability the most common measure is the variance. That is the expected value of the random variable minus um, 3.5. Okay? And see that this is, we can consider this, the distance. The distance between the random variable and the value 3.5 square. It's okay, that? Right. Uh, let's let's make the the exercise. So the variance is first value of x is one, so is 1 minus 3.5, 2.5 square times the probability, 1 over 6, plus the second value, 2 minus 3.5, 1.5 square times 1.6, 1 divided 6, and the other one, 3 minus uh, 3.5, 0 0.5 square, 1, 6, and the same for the other side, so we can put two, two and two, okay? But it's clear that this 2.5 is this distance. This is 2.5, it's a distance. And this 1.5 is this distance. Okay? So the variance is just an average distance from uh, the value to the expected value. It's okay? So, now you want, we want to make similar things, but for random graphs. 
Uh, first thing, we are going to work with random graph with n fix. Okay? And with what is called simple random graph, the graph that they can have a link or not, and they don't have loops. So now, now for graphs. Indirect, indirect. It can be direct, but indirect. Yeah. So we are going to call G the random graph. X is the random variable, G is the random graph. That what are the values of G? X can take the value one, two, three, four, five, or six. G can take the value graph one, graph two up to graph M. These are numbers? No. They are graphs. Okay? But this random graph take values in the graph space. So, if we want to make some statistics, we need to know what is the, for example, the probability that she, that the random graph take the value she one, and we put p g one, okay. And for all graph, we have the probability of that graph. So the only condition is the sum of all probabilities one, okay. So first thing. A graph, any graph, is characterized by its adjacency matrix. What this means? That if, if I put a graph like this one, five nodes, and I say this, and this, and this is the network. This graph is equivalent to say, okay, let's put this matrix that the order is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have no loop, that's why there is a zero, zero. between 1 and 2, no link, zero, between 1 and 3, one link, 1 and 4, no link, 1 and 5, no link, 2 the same, between 2 and 1, 0, 2 and all, 0, except number 5, 3, all except number 1, 4, all except number 5, and 5 with 2, and with 4, okay? So if I have this, I have this, and if I have this, I have this. So the, the, the first very simple uh, thing <laughs> is what we want to do, we want to compute what is the expected, expected graph. Hmm? All graphs are, are around which graph? That's the expected graph. Random, no, the random variable, the value of the dice, is around 3.5. The graph are around which graph? So, what, the, the, the most simple to do this is to say, okay, you have graph 1, let's say, uh, we're still working with um, random networks. So, what we are going to do, perhaps I start with taking a sample, perhaps it's more easy. I take a sample of networks. When I have a sample of network, I have a sample of adjacency matrix. One thing that we can do is to sum all adjacency matrix and divide it by n. What do we obtain if we do that? 
the first thing is no. Uh, perhaps I, I, I'm, I'm not clear. Perhaps L let me show what I'm saying. In the let put <laughs> the simplest case where I have a sample. I use um, small letters for sample. A random variable are in majuscules. Okay, this is my sample, and each ha each has an uh, HSNC matrix, and I can do this. Okay, let's say I have an expected graph that this expected graph has an HSNC graph whose elements. are only the sum of these in the appropriate coordinates. Okay? This is, let's say, uh, A1, Ij, plus A2, Ij, plus A, L, Ig, divided all by L. Hmm? What I'm doing? I'm doing only the average of this network. But what do I obtain when, when I do that? A weighted network. Okay? So if, if I do that, this is the sample version, not the version based in, 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 a, random sum, in a random variable. But it's, it's equivalent. You, we can do that. We can write that. Let's say G uh, has a matrix that is uh, A1 EG times the probability of the graph C1, okay? But the important thing is when you do that, you obtain matrix that, let's say, have values 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 8, and this type of value. And this is represented as a network with that has weight. Okay? This is more important than this. And this is very small. Okay? So that's, so cool. that's okay, but it has one problem. What is the problem about this average or expected graph? Hmm? Es exactly. This, this graph does not belong to the space of graphs. My space of graphs are graphs that has a 1 or a 0. So I, I, am, t I am obtaining a graph that is out of the space, and it's difficult to, un to interpret. Okay, you know if, if if you do this with uh, in in time, I don't know what, what I can obtain, and it's difficult to to interpret that. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to take another strategy, not this one. Uh, everything understand that that this it's not a good uh, strategy because this graph is not part of the uh, graph that are valid. So the, the second strategy is more simple. And uh, I, I'm going to try to come back to random uh, variables. So then we go to random networks. Uh, So now we have, again, random variables. And we have our dice. OK? So you remember that the, the expected value 
was here in 3.5. Hmm? We know that the distance from here, from here, and this one, and the other side, for the other side, are this. Okay? What happens if I say, no, the expected value is not 3.5. The expected is uh, 3.5. The expected value is this one. This one. Okay? What happens if I measure distance? I will have first a zero distance. I represent a point from this expected value to one zero distance. From one to two, I have this distance. For this value to 3, this distance, to 4, this distance, 5, this distance, and 6, and 6, this distance. Okay? Now, if I ask you which is the one that has uh, smallest average distance, which is? The smallest average distance. This one. Because let's see, the, the most large is this distance that it will be average with this and this. And this here is larger and will average with the same or, or greater. So if we study the average distance, what do we know? If we study the expected or average distance, but distance between whom? Between the, the central value and the random variable. The central value in this case, let <laughs> okay. This will be minimum at the center. Let me put a square there. So if, if, if I ask, what is the argument that minimizes this expected distance? Which number I have to put here? That is which one? This is what I call A. A is this one. Or A is this one, or A is here. That minimizes the distance. Which argument I have to put here that minimizes the distance, uh, the square distance, I will obtain the expected value. Hmm? But th this is nice. Why this is nice? Because it's an argument based in distance. And for networks, thinking about distance is, is, is a good strategy. Okay. So if if we try to study this function this student has to pay attention because soon we'll start the exercises. So if we study this function as a function of a, we will have an argument that minimizes that is expected value. Okay, this 3.5 in the example. Hmm? Okay. Uh, just a comment. I put a, a square there. Why, why the square? Why the square in the distance? I put here. Distance, square distance. Not distance. Now, distance are always positive because it's the absolute value. But distance, square distance, if it has the problem that penalize much the 
the values that are very large because if we are one meter square is one if 10 meters square is 100 so 100 is we want to not be very far from people that are very far that's the difference if between putting d or d square but in, in principle, there's no problem to put here. Not a square, to put distance directly. Okay? And what happens if we do that? Well, first thing, the square is nice because you, you, you have a function that you can derive it in, uh, everywhere. Uh, distance have this singular point that make all difficult okay but if you do this you don't obtain the expected value this is another estimate for a central point that everybody knows or use it Mauro this is the median not not this not the average It's the median if you if you minimize the distance you will obtain the 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 median if you minimize the distance square you will obtain the average it's a it's an uh, we let let put to practice an exercise <laughs> no no no, no. Let, let me show Okay, um, if we make a graph of the distance from x to a, not square distance from a, you will obtain something like this. For the data, data I show you. And any know what are these values? This must be three and four. There is not exists a unique value that minimizes the, the distance. That's why in, in statistics course you use, okay, if, if the number of data is um, par, even, you, you do the, the average of both. Because there are many, okay, take one. But if, the, if I change this and I put five and I put one over five, this will have a peak in three. It is unique. Huh? So the exercise to show qualitative only doing this argument that if you, 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 if you put here and you compare distance and you take an average, okay, this is the same if you are here. Okay? That's one of the exercises to show that. But qualitative, it's, it's not so, okay? So the, this typically, in a statistics, this is called mu, the expected value, and this typically is called mu tilde, that is the median, okay? So now you all know how to compute the average uh, graph. The first important thing is, which is the distance? If I know the distance, I minimize the distance and I will have the central graph, okay? Uh, okay, I forgot about this. Okay, the distance. The, f forgot about this, okay? Let's see this. I, I want to Compute the distance between these two graphs. And the most simple distance you can uh, define is the distance that only say, okay, you, you want to be from here to here. So what do you have to do? Okay, you have to take this one, but it's not here. This one, this one, this one, this one. Then you have to put this one, this, this, and this. 
So what is the distance? The distance is nine. The number of links that I have to eliminate and the number of links that I have to create to be equal. Okay? That's uh, a notion of distance that has sense. It's okay, that? That is called the DIT distance in graphs. What is the central graph? This is the central graph. It's the graph that minimizes in the space of graphs the expected distance, that distance, between the random graph and the, the, this is the argument you have to mi mani minimize. Okay? So the, the figure you have to have in mind is the following. This is a graph G1, a graph G2 in some space, C3, C4, and have sample versions of the random variable. And here I have a graph that is the central graph that minimizes all this distance. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this case, no, no. Uh, let me think. Okay. Uh, no, in in this case, not because they are t they take. No, no. Yes, it's different. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I can't try what, what type of network, but it's different. Yeah. So th this is the theoretical graph, central graph, but as in statistics, you don't have probabilities, you have data, okay? No, but it's, it doesn't matter. Um, so, I, I was saying, here is the theoretical case where we know the probability. In statistics, we don't know the probability, we have data. And what is data for us? Data is graph one, graph two, graph three, shell graphs, okay? That can be only one brain network that is evolving in time, and, and I have a, in time one, time two, time L, or I have a sample of networks of the same nodes. That's, that's important. So the, the empirical version of this is very easy is, let's say, in statistics, we use hat for an estimator of the graph of everything. This is the central graph. This is an estimator of, the, of what is down. Uh, and we have to put the argument that minimize not the expected value, because we don't have probability, only the average, one over the average, of the distance, of the empirical, uh, of the empirical distance. Okay, you see the, the change. The, the only change is you can't put expected value. So don't put this, put one over L sum of the values you have. Values are graphs. And here, don't put random graph, put the sample, okay? The graph of the sample. So th this is from data. Now we have a central graph. Okay. Good question. It 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 takes uh, between 0 0.5 seconds and 0 0.2. <laughs> no, no, no. We, it's a very important question because when you see this, you have to minimize a function that is in a huge space. For students, if I have a graph of n nodes and I define the 
space G as all the graph, the possible graphs, GM, which is the value of M. It's huge. How many graphs there are, are there? Huh? Two, two to the n, n minus one divided by two. This is a huge number. Even when n is 20. Okay? That's a very important issue. So, if the space is huge, how can I find this graph that minimizes the argument? Okay? The, comp the computational di distance, yeah, sure. It's extremely simple. But if, if I want to, let's say, compute all and see what is the expected, let's say, if I put a G, and, and this is the function f, and I want to find which is this one. The number here is huge, it's, yeah. but yes. When, and, okay, so how, how to compute uh, g? Uh, we have a result that is very simple, how to compute. And the results say, we on, you only have to find um, let's let me write it well. GC is a central graph, okay? It's a unique graph. If um, If all links have probability different from one half, hello? Wait. Yes, the, the, the equal. It, yeah, it's this is the L, L1 distance. Uh, and this GC has. Ah, an adjacency matrix A, G, C. That is one or zero, and one is one when the probability is greater than one half. And this is when it's smaller. That, that means, take a sample of networks. This is the, the, the population version or the theoretical version. The empirical version is the same but here you put not probability, you put the sum of the graphs observed in the Position ij divided by l is greater than one half. So l l let me show you with one example. So uh, we have an analytic way to, to obtain it. It's okay. It's clear how to compute it. So, for example, if if we have, let's say, this graph, one, two, three, this graph, one, two, and this graph. Okay. This is an empirical graph. This is a data. Okay. 
C1, C2, C3. So who is G, the central graph? It is the graph that has each link more than half of the times. It's only this one. Okay. You zoom the adjacency matrix and you see the Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to make any computation. Okay? And uh, and this is the let's say if this is G1, this is G2, this is G3, G Z is here. Okay? This minimizes this distance. So, uh, let me show some examples, because if not, perhaps you will get out. Um, okay, if it's one half, you can, depending, that there is, uh, yeah, yeah. De depending on how many links are exactly one half, you, you, you can put it or, or let it out. This is, it, but it's a good question. The question is, if, if some link is one half, the probability is one half, what I have to do? It's equivalent to the problem I told you why we have this structure in the random, uh, in the random variable. Why it's flat? Because there are many values that, have, that minimize the distance. If P is equal one half, there are many graphs that uh, we, we characterize, characterize the set, but later I can show you if you want. It's okay? So l let's put an example. Let me see. Okay. X random variable. There is a very well known random variable that is the double exponential random variable. That is has this density. Where fx is okay, it has exponential decay and uh, it can take any value. What is called the exponential run? Thank you. Absolute value. But Siddhartha, see here. Siddhartha, see here. Important example. This is exponential random variable. Okay? But this is the absolute value. Wait. This is the same to put the distance between x and x zero. Okay? The absolute value. Always positive. And this is in random variables. So now think of a graph. Ah, lambda is a positive parameter. That has to be with it's more like this. More deep or okay. So let's propose a uh, probability distribution for a graph. That similar to this. What can we do? We can say, okay, there exists a graph that is the central graph, what we call G, G zero. Okay, not central, but later we see if that's central. And we will say the probability that the random graph take the value C is C A and E to the minus distance between G and G zero. Yeah, G. Okay, and now we have a probability for a random graph. That this probability is similar in some space that we don't know how to graphicate, but there is a central graph, G0, and then it decay. If this graph, if this is G0, if near than G1, it will have 
large probability. If this is G2, it's larger, it has smaller probability as going there. OK? So now it's our first real exercise. Yes. So this is the probability in the graph space. We, uh, as an exercise, the idea is to show that GC, the central graph, the graph that minimizes, is equal G0. OK? This is exercise one. Ah, and exercise two. Two um, is Erdos Renzi model. Uh, do you remember? In Erdos Renzi model, each link has probability P. And what I want to compute is what is G C for the Erdos Renzi model. But as a value, uh, let's say, GC, as a value of P. Now remember, in Erdos Renzi model, you have the two parameters, the probability of a link. If someone, ¿cómo se dice? Se anima. Se anima. Yes. If someone does uh, to say which must be this graph, can. Does someone have the intuition about w which is the, the central graph in the Erdos Renzi model? The question is which is the central graph in the Erdos Renzi model? Here, here it seems that P is fixed. Yes, as the Erdos Renzi model. That's all. Yeah. So, okay, this is exercise number two. The, in order to help you a little, think that this is an homogeneous system. You don't have a, a, a preference graph. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about now. This is uh, so up till now we. We studied this central. Okay. Now we are going to say, okay, what's variability? I have a sample of networks that is a sample from schizophrenia data. I have a sample of networks that is normal people. The variance, the, the expected value perhaps is the same. They have the same central graph. But the variance, all graphs are nearer in, in one situation. All other graphs are near, uh, are further. Okay, so the, the, to have a measure of variance is, is important. <laughs> How can be done? Uh, it's very easy. Okay. Th then I come with this. So variability. Think th that we are in the graph space. We have these ten graphs. Okay. We compute the central graph that is here. Okay? What is the variability? Just see what are uh, the distance hmm? between the central graph and the other graphs. And if the distance in average 
it's large, you have more variability. If, if they are all near, you have less variability. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Let, let me put it here. No, I have two situations. This is GC, the central graph, and these are some graphs. Okay? And here, okay, blue are controls, red are patients. Okay, which are near? Blue one. In average, blue one, they have this distance that the average of this, let's say, is this distance. Red. That the average, let's say, is this one. So the variability is computed as the expected distance from the graphs of the sample graph or the theoretical graph to the central graph. That is, if you think of, of, for example, a multivariate normal distribution, you can do the same. You have x, y points, and you say, okay, this is the, the expected value, and I compute only one thing, not the covariance matrix, I compute only the average distance. At this average distance is a measure of how variability you have in total. You can say, okay, but there are many ways in a normal to, 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 be, um, to increase the variance. That's true. But in the space of networks, this is a third approach. Yeah. It's not possible. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. Yes. With this distance, yes. But yes, if, if I can do like an, a histogram, in one case will be, let's say, something like this, and in the other case you say something like this. Yeah, yeah, but it's always... Yeah, yeah, variability is tell me only one number that has to do with the range, something like this, of the values. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, we, we, this type of problem, uh, a good strategy for, uh, to attack this problem is like with principal components. But we, we are, I don't think we have time. So here we have a, a measure of variability. Okay. Uh, this is for the elves. <laughs> Compute the, what is the expected value, uh, the um, the variance of the Erdogan model. Okay, it, it's not difficult. It seems very difficult, but really, it's not difficult. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I think that the I will say something more related with, imagine you have this problem, okay? You have uh, 20 patients hmm? and you want to, based on, on the networks, to say, mm, this is the worst patient based on the network, okay? If, if you think in, in abstract space, in like in one dimension, you can say, okay, this is the variable I'm, I'm studying. I have one, two, three, four, uh, and ten patients. Which is the worst, this one or this one? I don't know. 
but the ones that are in the tail. Okay? So, if you think about that, <laughs> we can do the same here. There are some patients that are near to the central graph, and some patients that, that can be an outlier that is uh, very far from the central graphs. Okay? And, uh, and it's, it's easy to, co to compute that average distance from the patient to, to, to all the patients. Okay? For example, in this case, I show you. If I compute, for example, what is the distance from here, from this subject to all, this distance will be large, okay, in average. But for this subject, no. Because there are some that are close to one side, right? and in average, it will be shorter. So a measure of what is called a, a deep function in statistics, that's something called the, the, the diff of, of, of the data can be just doing this. Okay. Okay. A diff function is a function that orders the space in terms of center outward position. Okay. You are near to this common value or you are very far from there. There are many measures. But in our case, we, we can define this value that is the expected distance from H to a random graph. So in, in this way, we can sort in some way and say, um, which uh, network is atypical and which is typical. He, this value will be obviously the, the central graph. But I think this has many applications to, to try to identify based on the network, which are strange networks in some sense. Okay? Uh, I, I think this is one way to do it, but but in the in the graph space we can we cannot do that. In the, in the Euclidean space, yes, that that's the difference. We are not in the Euclidean space, but in the in the Euclidean space, it did, in fact, this is the Mahalanovic distance, deep one over that in order to but so uh, and finally only some comments I, I don't have time and I think you are a little bit exhausted um, the idea is in practice you can have a sample of networks perhaps the same subject in time and for this type of data this is EG data. You can compute what is a central graph, what is the, um, uh, the variability, uh, how, how is the D, for example, this is atypical or not? And we, we, you, can you, we can use one argument like this to define how atypical. Also, we can do clustering. No, so suppose we have uh, networks and we don't know that they are in this way distributed. We are not in the Euclidean space, we are in a huge space. And we, w we want to identify uh, clusters and, and we can do it based on the distance as, uh, let's say, k-means. Okay? Uh, Let me show only this example and, and now I finish. For example, let's uh, now I put here with a, a very simple model of 
that has clusters. Which are the clusters? We have three centers and exponential decays. Okay? So we're putting something like this structure. We have this, this, and this. And, th and they are in th this is a graph space. And this, and this is one of the centers, one is the center, one is the center. Ah, this is a representation, but it's not true. Okay? So now we want to identify if we, uh, if we um, take a sample of network with this distribution that is a mixture of exponentials, if we are able to recognize three groups, and these are the centers. Okay? And <laughs> what I'm showing here is these are test graphs, these are the three centers. And for example, this is the empirical width that we have to maximize. When you, you, we use, for example, one center and two test graphs, two centers and one test graph, and three centers. In the three center, we have the largest value. Um, this graph has one particularity, that's why it's there, that this, that this is the central graph. If you see these three centers and this image, this graph, perhaps you can imagine why that's... Because, let's say, link 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, one, six this and all, but two-thirds, let's say. 3, 4, 3, 4, oh, 3, 4. And 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, okay? So th this is the, the, the real center graph in a space where there is not exist a, a clear center, because there are three centers. But if, if I do, what happens is I do cluster analysis when I say, find only one group, what will happen? <laughs> you will find that the maximum is at the center graph. So this is just to show you that this works. Okay. Uh, Okay, I, I think that's enough. Okay, uh, questions or answers to the exercises? He knows the answer. To what? To the exercise. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm cheating. No, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting new concepts, I guess. And, um, any hint if the networks have different number of sites? Then if the networks have different number of sites, then there's nothing we can do so far? N different number of sites? Nodes, yeah, no. Sites. It, it is valid for any n. No, 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 but one has five nodes, the other has. No, ah, that, that's very important. No. Yeah, yeah, that's what the, I mean. Yeah. The, the, I know the they have to be the same, but. The, the theory yeah. is for the same number of nodes. Yeah. Because. You can patch it with, with nodes that are not here, but are not coupled to any, anything else. Yes, but. but, but, but they go to the same dimension and you can do it. Yes, yeah. yes but. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, the important thing is you, you have to have the same node, and this node is different from the other one. You, you can s make some assumption, but I don't know what's that. Uh, let's say if I put the brain of a monkey and the brain of a man, and I say this is a node, okay, it's, it's it can be done. But Actually, uh, I was asking Gish exactly the same thing because uh, I was thinking of, of Natalia's work of, of, of words, and so you, the different patients will not say the same words. Yeah. So we, if you want to analyze that, you have to get rid of a lot of, of all the words that do not occur in all the reports. Yeah. So in the end, you decimate your, so you, you will end up with a very small graph, right? Yeah, but, but the, the, the strategy can be different. Can you, you can make, l l let's say, uh, different 
questionario where you put, let's say, the notes and you see how they express that notes. You understand what I mean? So you can use all the, all the words and assume zero connections. In some connections. set of words for you are important and now you see how they interact all with all that word. No, that, that, no that, that, that's true, but... No, no, here come, okay, so that's, okay, I understand that. Now, if you're dealing with brain activity, say, yeah. and you say, well, you know, I'm measuring, I'm saying that we, we I can compare uh, our brains ac um, among ourselves because we all have the Broca area in the same portion of the frontal left uh, hemisphere. Yeah. Um, but when this is not true, I mean, if, if, you, if you have some variability, and you do have, yeah. then can, what, well, how would you go about that? Would you be able to morph one? So you would say, well, your Broca area is actually displaced. So, in, you know, what, you know, voxel such and such in you is not the same thing as in Mauro Copelli. So you would be able to morph one graph into the other so that you can, could do all that? Yeah, you can, but I think it's the type of things you don't want to do. <laughs> but yes, you can. Because the consequence is not clear, but yes. So, this is extremely interesting. I, I mean, because we have some data like this with spiking networks, and we always have different numbers of nodes. We don't know how to compare them. It's a total mess. Uh, one thing we try to do is subsample the networks. You know, so let's say you've got 500 nodes. You subsample it down to like 150. So each, you do that many times, and then we just average them. So I'm really glad to see this, and I, I want to look into this. I'm more familiar with your work with Dante on uh, fMRI and that sort of stuff. So here's a question then. If you have uh, a, a sort of an average graph or a median graph or a central graph, and then you also have a measure of standard deviation, uh, is this correct then to say that you can say that a treatment is statistically significant if you then compare the two average graphs and then you basically take the standard deviation, and if they don't overlap, then you can say it's significantly different? Yeah, not exactly as you, you say, but uh, we have a test of hypothesis for, for graph, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's great. That's very needed for the field. And one, one important thing that I, I think, w when I start with this, I say, oh, all, all goes very well. Why people don't think this is very easy? What is happening? I, I think that that uh, that has to be with this bias of elves of having all homogeneous. In your system, both systems, you say my my electrodes are homogeneous also. So th th this, I think, is is the I say why I haven't found at least up till now one paper saying these simple things. Uh, I, I, I know that it is needed in the field. Uh, many people are working with networks. Our paper about in PLOS One, we, we compute uh, local properties of networks and I think we can do much Not in telegraph, yeah. Uh. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think uh, you have everyone overwhelmed. So uh, hopefully the students will be here for the exercises. Um, Perfect. We'll see more of you then. Okay, 